Hi, welcome back to Katia's Buzz. I just passed my part 107 FAA drone pilot certificate. I passed it with 92% and I had to study. It's not an easy test. There is no way you're going to walk to that test and think you're going to pass it. It's very specific information required by the FAA. The reason to pass that test is if you're going to fly a drone professionally, commercially, you are not authorized to fly the drone without passing that test. So it's a must for some of us. And uh, I'm uh, including everything that I feel is relevant for the test on the slideshows that we're going to go over. Everything has an importance. So I suggest you go over this training a couple of times, stop at the slides you don't understand, make sure you understand them, go over it as much as you can, as often as you can until you get that test and ace it. The first time you look at the content, don't discourage. The first time I looked at it, I was totally overwhelmed. I thought I would never make it. It's just not the type of information that I'm used to. It has nothing to do with the work I do. So it was a little bit overwhelming, but believe me, after a while, after practicing, it'll make perfect sense and you will master this stuff. So don't discourage. If I can do it, you can do it. Let's jump in. The first thing you need to do to prepare for this test is to download the test supplement. So go to the link I provide in the comments below, download it, print it, you will be using it over and over again. Everything that comes from the test is in that supplement and you will get a copy of the supplement when we do the exam. So you want to be comfortable with everything that's on it so that you're not just learning a new thing. Get used to have it in paper form in front of you that's going to be your best friend. Let's start by going over the drone rules and FAA regulations. In order to be eligible, you have to be 16 years of age. You have to pass a recurrent test every 24 months. If you change your address, you have 30 days to notify the FAA. So when you fly a drone, the crew members available are the pilot in command, which is yourself, you have to be certified, and you are responsible for everything. During the test, you will be asked a variety of questions. Who needs to be responsible for A to Z? And it's always going to be the pilot in command. As the pilot in command, you are responsible for everything that goes wrong on the flight, the maintenance of your drone, the visual observer is optional and it is here to supplement your situal awareness and visual line of sight. You must always maintain VLOS unless you have a waiver. There are a lot of reasons why, but you need to always keep your eyes on your drone and your visual observer may be a secondary option for them to also be able to keep a VLOS on your drone. The registration costs $5 and is good for three years. You have to go to fadronezone.fa.gov to get registered and you have to make sure you display that registration on your drone and that is visually visible. So you can print it on a piece of paper and put tape on it or you can print a label and stick it on the side of your drone. It needs to be quite visible on your drone at all times. If you are a visiting foreign national, you must register your drone when you arrive in the United States. And if your drone is destroyed, sold, lost, or transferred to another operator, you need to cancel your registration. You may be required to report an accident or in-flight emergency. You need to report an accident to the FAA within 10 days. It needs to have at least a serious injury to any person, loss or consciousness, skin laceration that requires suturation, a broken bone, or head trauma, or the damage to any property other than your drone needs to cost greater than $500 either to repair it or to replace it. You need to report the accident through your FAA drone zone account and if you deviate from the part 107 rules to respond to an emergency, you must send a report upon request by the FAA. The key word here is upon request by the FAA. Operation limitations. You must not fly your drone over 87 knots or 100 miles an hour. 
your minimum visibility at all times is three statute miles. You need to be 500 feet below the clouds and 2,000 feet horizontally from clouds. 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontally from the clouds. The FAA inspection compliance. Any officer of the FAA is allowed to inspect your drone, pilot in command, the visual observer. They may require to look at your flight logs, records, reports. All documents need to comply with the FAA regulations. Flying from moving vehicles. The Part 107 does not permit operation from a moving vehicle unless it's from a land or waterborne vehicle and it is over a sparsely populated area. This is the keyword, sparsely populated area. And operating from any other moving vehicle is prohibited. If you are in a moving helicopter, boat, you are not at all authorized to fly your drone. A lot of rules have changed in April of 2021. So now the FAA permits routine operations over people, moving vehicles and at night under certain conditions without needing a waiver. These rules started in April 2021 and the information is coming out as we speak. Just make sure you always keep current on the latest FAA requirements for the exam. Part of these new rules is the categories 1, 2, 3 and 4. The FAA risk-based framework for flying drones over people. In the past you were not at all authorized to fly over people, now you can, but it requires you to be in one of those categories. So let's go over them. The questions were on my test, you will be tested on this. So category 1 allows you to operate over people if your drone weighs less than 0.55 pounds. That's a very small drone. It does not have exposed rotating parts that would lacerate human skin. It does not require the FAA MOC or DOC, which are documents required. And it does not require a label. That's category one. Category two, you are permitted to operate over people if your drone weighs more than 0.55 pounds. It must not cause injury to a person greater than 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy. It does not have exposed rotating parts that would lacerate human skin. It has the MOC and DOC, and it has a clear label category two on the drone. Category three, it's for an unmanned aircraft or a drone that is over 0.55 pounds. Under category three, you cannot operate your drone over open air assemblies of human beings. It may operate over people over restricted access site and all people are notified. The drone does not maintain sustained flight over any person unless that person is participating. The drone must not cause injury to a person greater than 25 foot pound of kinetic energy does not have exposed rotating parts that would lacerate human skin. It has both the MOC and DOC and has a clear label category three. Category four, permitted to operate over people. You must have an airworthiness certificate issued under part 21. You must comply with labeling requirements. You must have the FAA approved flight manual you must have preventive maintenance alterations or inspections performed. Remember the variations between the four categories. Alcohol and drugs. As you can imagine, it's not really intelligent or safe for you to fly your drone if you're not 100%. So they are very specific. You cannot have any more than 0.4% alcohol in your blood while you're flying. You have not had a drink in the last eight hours. So if you're having a beer, a glass of wine, you are not authorized to fly your drone for the next eight hours. If you are in doubt regarding the effect of any medication over the counter, do not fly unless you contact the aviation medical examiner. Many, if you take anything to help you sleep or for anxiety or anything like that, and you feel drowsy, 
please contact the aviation medical examiner and make sure that you can fly under these conditions. On the test, you will hear from dehydration and heat stroke means critical loss of water, hyperventilation is breathing very quickly, and stress and fatigue. Do not fly if you have stress or fatigue. Uh, there will be questions, uh, should you fly if you have been driving for 12 hours and uh, are very tired? No, you should not, you should rest. And also questions to the effect that uh, you have a lot of stress at home, you're very anxious, should you fly? Absolutely not, you need to make sure you deal with your issues and have no anxiety before you're able to fly. Hazardous flight operations. In any flight emergency, rule number one is to maintain control of your aircraft. Rule number one is to maintain control of your aircraft. You need to keep control of your aircraft. Aeronautical decision making, also called ADM. The aeronautical decision making is a systematic mental approach to consistently determine the best course of action in a given situation. Crew resource management, CRM. Effective use of all available resources, human hardware, software, and information prior to and during flight to ensure the success outcome of the operation. You need to learn three acronyms to pass that exam. One of them is I'm safe. The first I is illness, M is medical, S for stress, A for alcohol, F for fatigue, E for emotion or eating. Illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, emotion or eating. PAVE is P is for pilot in command, and under the P is when you're going through the I'm safe. The A is for your aircraft, V is for environment, and E is for external pressure. Decide, detect, estimate, choose, identify, do, evaluate. Make sure you know these acronyms, they will be on the test. Make sure you review them a few minutes before you walk into that exam so that you remember what each letter means. Hazardous attitudes. They will either ask you what the hazardous attitude means or its antidote. So anti-authority is when you don't want someone to tell you what to do. The antidote is to follow the rules. Impulsivity is when you do things a little bit too fast. The antidote is not too fast, Think first before you fly your drone. Invulnerability means it never, nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. Well, unfortunately it could. So the antidote is to remind yourself, well, it can happen to me, slow down. Machismo is usually when you're trying to prove that you're better than everyone else. It's a lot of ego. And the antidote is to not take chances because taking chances is foolish. Resignation is to say, you know what, whatever, there's nothing I can do, I'm not gonna make it. The antidote is I'm not helpless, I can bring that drone back home, I'm not going to injure anyone, get yourself back on track. Airspace authorization and waivers. The airspace authorization is when you request access to controlled airspace. I am often requested to fly in airport airspace and I go through the GPS on my drone, I make a request, the FAA responds in less than 10 minutes, gives you authorization or not, depending on what's going on. And at that point, your drone will be able to fly. You can apply for a waiver. Uh, these are some examples of waivers. You need to request your waiver 90 days in advance. It may take less, but that's the requirement. So make sure you send your request for waiver 90 days before the date you're supposed to fly. So you can ask for a waiver for operations from a moving vehicle or aircraft, visual line of sight aircraft operation, visual observer, operation of multiple small unmanned aircraft, operation near an aircraft, operation over people, and operating limitations like ground speed, altitude, minimum visibility, minimum distance from clouds, etc. Night flight. Daylight is from 30 minutes before official sunrise to 30 minutes after official sunset. Civil twilight is that little time 30 minutes before official sunrise and 30 minutes 
after official sunset. During civil twilight, you must have lights that are visible for at least three miles. The eyes take 30 minutes to fully adapt to darkness. It's much easier for you to use red lights than white lights because it's much less harmful to the eyes in the dark. You will probably get that question in your exam. What kind of light should you read your manual before you fly at night? It's a red light, not a white light. You have to scan the sky in 30 degree increments and pause no more than two or three seconds. Cigarette smoking is the most decreased visual sensitivity at night. So if you're a smoker, it's not good for you. Night lights on manned aircraft, when you see in the sky a plane flying, the color of the lights will tell you if it's coming towards you or going away from you. So on the left wing, you'll see a red light. On the right wing, you'll see a green light. And on the rear of the aircraft, you will see a white light. At night, you'll also see anti-collision lighting in the form of a red or white strobe or rotating beacon. So if you're looking at an aircraft and you see a red light on the left, you know the aircraft is going away from you. If the red light is on the right, it is coming towards you. The sectional aeronautical chart is one of the pages in your test supplement and it is going to become your best friend. A lot of the answers to the questions on the exam are right here, right in front of your eyes. And you can go to this page as many times as you want. And we'll go over the different sections of the sectional aeronautical chart that makes sense during the exam. Make sure you're familiar with what's on that page. Make sure you look at it very carefully and know the information that's available because it will become very handy when you take the exam. A lot of the things that you think you may have to learn by heart are right here for you. So airspace. Airspace is going to be a big part of your studies. And thankfully, the information is right here on the chart. This is a visual uh, provided by the FAA on pretty much how the airspace functions. As you can see, it has ceilings and surface and it's like layered cakes on top of one another so depending where you fly you may be under a class b but not in a class b or you can be on a class g or e so you have to really spend a lot of time go over this so the class b airspace is dark blue line class c airspace is the dark magenta line class d airspace with ceiling which the ceiling is going to be in these uh, squares, is going to be dashed blue lines. Class E airspace from the surface is dashed magenta lines. The fuzzy red lines is class E airspace with floor at 700 feet above surface. And class E airspace with floor 1200 feet above surface is a fuzzy blue line. In order to find out the different questions that are going to come up, where is the surface or the ceiling or in, on any particular airspace and if therefore you're authorized to fly in it or not without authorization, is going to be more or less like this. The class B airspace, B stands for big, it's the most major airports. You will see like the layers 130 over SFC. Every time you see 130, 110, 50, you always had two zeros. So it's the surface to 13,000 feet. Or if you get 110 over 20, it means the surface is 2,000 feet and the ceiling is 11,000 feet, which means the class B airspace is only from 2,000 feet to 11,000 feet. So if you fly under that, you are not flying in the class B airspace and you're authorized to fly. Airspace C stands for cities and you have two circles around the cities, five nautical miles or 10 nautical miles. Class D airspace will have the ceiling around those brackets. 
If the ceiling of class D airspace is a 40 in the brackets, that means the ceiling is at 4,000 feet. If there is a minus behind 40, it means it is up to but not including 4,000 feet. So just remember, if there is a minus, it means that it's not including the actual number. Class E airspace is from the floor to 700 feet AGL or 1200 feet AGL, and we'll go over AGL and MSL a little bit later on. Class G is where you are authorized to fly without authorization. It is not class B, class C, class D. Or class E airspace, all four classes require authorization from the FAA, except in class G where you can fly without issue. So you will spend most of your time in class G airspace. You're going to have a lot of questions relating to these airspace, so you need to be able to recognize them and go over them. This is a typical map. It's actually one of the most complicated one, but they will take any which airport and ask you their ceiling surface, and it's not easy. So what I did is I purchased the magnifying glass and as stupid as it may look, it was quite helpful. You don't necessarily have to use it throughout the whole time, but in order to just find the airport or find the lake or find whatever it is they're talking about and at least get a big idea of the overall area, that's going to be a big part of the question is finding the place where they're telling you to see. If they tell you it's around number five, you see those little circles, two, four, five, that's what they're referring to and that's quite helpful because sometimes there is just so much going on in those maps that you need to be able to quickly find where the information is they're talking about and that will help you then decide uh, the answer to whatever question. I recommend you buy a magnifying glass. It was extremely helpful to me. You can get this at uh, Amazon for $15, $20. I will put a link to it uh, in the comments below if you want. Special airspace. Prohibited is always with a P and it's national welfare. In prohibited areas, you are not allowed to fly your drones. However, you can fly in any of the other airspaces with extreme caution. Restricted will start with an R and it has artillery firing, aerial gunnery or guided missiles. Warning is hazardous. Alert is with an A and it has high volume of pilot training or unusual activity. And the MOAs are military operation areas. And in order to find out if it's active, you look at the border of the sectional chart. TFRs are temporary flight restrictions. They are government VIPs, special events, natural disasters, or other unusual events. And in notices of airmen, which are called NOTAMs, it's time critical and temporary. And you can find those out at 1-800-WXBRIEF.com. Latitude and longitude. You will need to know how to find locations from their latitude and longitude. And you need to, of course, understand what that means. If you are not sure, uh, remember latitude sounds like ladder, up and down, north to south. Longitude is right to left. And because I am in Florida, it actually goes in reverse. So you add a number going left. It's unusual, but that's how it gets done. One degree is always 60 minutes, and you will see the small notches on the map, and each line makes 30 minutes. So each half degree, you have another line. So you have to also know what that means. If in a question they talk about seconds, so you will have degree, minutes, and seconds, just ignore it, it's just to throw you off. It's much too small to worry about. And then you may get a question where you need to convert decimals to degrees. If you get 23.93, you know that this is a decimal. So what you need to do is you take that decimal. So here it's 93. You multiply 0 0.93 by 60 minutes. It becomes 56 minutes. And so 23.93 degrees north becomes 23.56 degrees north. There will be a question like that on your exam.
The VFR checkpoints, Visual Reporting Checkpoint or Waypoint for Manned Aircraft. In the sectional chart, there is information on the topography, obstacle clearance and other airspace consideration. If you see a flag on a map, it means there is higher amount of manned aircraft traffic in the area and that will probably be on your exam and notification boxes on sectional chart. On occasion, there will be answers to your questions directly on the chart. So make sure you look around and see if there is a message like who to call for balloon areas or things of that nature. AGL or MSL. AGL is above ground level. Above ground level is how you are above the ground. Mean sea level is how you are in relation to the sea level. So on the sectional chart, all numbers that denote altitude are in mean sea level, except class E airspace, 700 feet AGL or 1200 feet AGL. If you see on the chart, the height of a mountain, it will usually have the number in mean sea level and right below it, in parentheses, the above ground level. The isogonic lines. As you see here on the graphic, there is a little 11 W. That is the isogonic line and what it means, it's magnetic variation. It's a difference from true to magnetic north. Maximum elevation figures. The minimum flight altitude to clear all obstacles in the quadrant. So you see the big three and the small five, that's actually 3,500 feet. The two and four is 2,400 feet. Victor Airway is always going to be a little blue line with a number V15 here, V15. And it's a straight line segment and it depicts low altitude civilian air traffic. A chart supplement is formally called an airport facility directory and it provides the most comprehensive information on a given airport that may be asked on your exam. In order to get the chart supplement, you can go to skyvector.com. Runways. Runways are labeled 1 to 36. That is the runway's magnetic alignment. Runway 9 indicates 90 degree magnetic which means to the east. A pilot using runway 9 is landing or taking off to the east, heading 90 degrees. Runway 18 indicates 180 degree magnetic, which means it's going south. A pilot using runway 18 is landing or taking off to the south, heading 180 degrees. Traffic patterns. The normal traffic pattern at an airport is a left pattern, unless the airport has it another way. So in a question it may ask, you know, is it always a left pattern? No, uh, you are supposedly required to ask that airport if they are indeed using the left pattern. But in most cases they will be using the left pattern, which implies that all turns are made to the left. An aircraft announces is mid-field left downwind to runway 36. Remember that, that will be in your exam. An aircraft announces he is mid-field left downwind to runway 36. That means he is actually on the opposite side of the runway. The runway runs south-north, the airplane will be taking off or landing at a 360 degree heading or from south to north. So if a plane lands on runway 36 on the downwind leg, it is west of the runway, opposite of the landing runway. You may want to draw this on a paper that will be provided to you. I also draw the runways in order to know where the plane is coming or going, which will also be on your exam. Right of way. A remote pilot in command cannot interfere with operations and traffic patterns at any airport. In controlled and uncontrolled G airspace, yield the right of way to all other aircrafts. Avoid all potential hazard. It's called see and avoid. 
and the FAA wants you to quickly scan left to right in intervals no more than 10 degrees to efficiently cover the entire sky. Weather and micrometeorology. Absolute altitude is the height above ground level. True altitude is the height above mean sea level. Density altitude measures the density of air. Pressure altitude is altitude when the barometric pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury. On a standard day, you have 15 degrees Celsius, which is also 59 degrees Fahrenheit, and 29.92 inches of mercury. Remember that. 15 degrees Celsius equals 59 degrees Fahrenheit, equals 29.92 inches of mercury, that is a standard day. And on a standard day, pressure altitude equals density altitude. Density altitude. Higher density altitude occurs with higher elevation, higher temperature, higher humidity, lower atmospheric pressure. Lower density altitude occurs at lower elevation, lower temperature, lower humidity, higher atmospheric pressure. Convective currents. Different surfaces radiate heat in varying amounts. The land gives off amounts of heat while the water and trees absorb and retain heat. So it creates areas of circulation that are called convective currents. Wind shear, are extremely dangerous for drone pilots. It can affect any flight and any pilot at any altitude. Remember that. It can affect any flight and any pilot at any altitude. Around thunderstorms, low level temperature inversion, frontal zones and clear air turbulence. Microbursts are also very dangerous for pilots. It is one mile horizontally, a thousand feet vertically, and it can last 15 minutes. Severe downdrafts of up to 6,000 feet per minute, and it has a hazardous wind direction change of 45 degrees or more in a matter of seconds. So you do not want your drone to be caught in a microburst. Moisture. Evaporation means liquid to water vapor. Sublimation means ice to water vapor. Relative humidity. Humidity is the amount of water vapor present in the atmosphere. Relative humidity is, let's say you have 95% relative humidity, means the air holds 95% of the total moisture it can hold at that temperature and pressure. Temperature and dew point. The dew point is the temperature at which the air can hold no more moisture, so it's 100% humidity. When the air is completely saturated, the moisture begins to condense, and when it condenses, it creates fog, dew, frost, clouds, rain, hail, or snow. When the temperature and the dew point converge, it creates fog. Fog. There is radiation fog, which is low-lying areas like mountain valley. Advection fog, it's coastal areas where the sea breeze goes over land masses. Upslope fog is up a slope and it can last for days. Steam fog is over water, we sometimes call it sea smoke. Ice fog is when temperature is way below freezing. Frost is when the dew point is lower than zero degrees Celsius. It is hazardous. It decreases the lift capacity of the aircraft. Remember that. Frost decreases the lift capacity of the aircraft. You need to learn how to read a METAR. And it looks very complicated. But believe me, after a while, you actually can make sense of all of this. You will have a couple of questions, and so you need to become familiar with what those numbers mean. Even though you will never, ever have to actually read a meter to fly a drone, but it is in the exam, so best luck with that. 
After the word METAR, you see K-I-N-K, -K, that is the name of the airport. The K is uh, always in front and the I-N-K is the name of the actual airport. 121845Z means the date is the 12th of the month at 1845 Zulu time. 11012G18KT means the wind is 110 degree true. At 12 knots, the G means gusts to 18 knots. 15SM means the visibility is 15 statute miles. SKC stands for sky condition clear. And then the 25 slash 17 is temperature and dew point. So it's the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and the dew point is 17 degrees Celsius. The A3000 is the altimeter. The altimeter is 30 inches of mercury. BKN means broken. OVC means overcast. BR means mist. SH means showers and RA means rain. BR mist, remember that, that's the only one that's kind of difficult to memorize. BR means mist. And to read a TAF is very similar to the METAR, but it's a little bit longer. It's a terminal aerodrome forecast and it's a weather report for five mile radius around larger airports. So that's what it looks like. And now we're going to see what it means. So this is the TAF for the Memphis airport. So a K again with M-E-M -E for Memphis. 12, 17, 20 Z is the 12th of the, the day of the month at 17, 20 Zulu time. 12, 18 to 13, 24 means it is valid from the hours of 1800 on the 12th to 2400 Zulu time on the 13th. 212 KT 5 SM H Z B K N 030 P R O B 40 2022 1 SM T S R A O V C 008 C B means the wind at 200 degrees at 12 knots, visibility 5 statute miles with haze, HD mean haze, broken clouds at 3,000 feet. Remember, you're adding two zeros, so it's 30, so that's 3,000 feet with between, now, between 2,000 Zulu time and 22 Zulu time a 40% probability of visibility one statute mile. Thunderstorm with rain, clouds overcast at 800 feet with cumulonimbus clouds. I know it sounds like a lot, but believe me, after you've done it a few times, you will know just enough to be able to figure out what they're asking you. The second big line means from 22.00 Zulu time, there are winds of 330 degrees at 15 knots, gusting to 20 knots. Visibility greater than six statute miles. The P means greater than. The clouds will be broken at 1500 feet Again, it's the 0, 15, you add two zero after 15, it's 1,500 feet. And overcast at 2,500 feet. 0, 2, 5, you add two zeros, 2,500 feet. The next one, between 2,200 Zulu time and 0, 0,200 Zulu time, there is a 40 probability of visibility, three statute miles, and rain showers. The next one, from 0 200 Zulu time, there will be winds of 350 degrees at 12 knots, 
clouds overcast at 800 feet. You see the 008, you add two zeros, it's 800 feet. Next one, between 0200 Zulu time and 0500 Zulu time, that's the 02 and 05, there is a 40% probability of visibility of two statute miles becoming rain and snow between 0600 Zulu time and 0800 Zulu time with wind 20 degrees at 8 knots broken clouds at 1200 feet becoming between 1000 Zulu time and 1200 Zulu time on the 13th winds 0 degrees at 0 knots visibility 3 statute miles mist and clear sky you see BR is mist and clear skies then there is temporary on the 12th between 1200 Zulu time and 1400 Zulu time visibility of one half statute miles you have to be careful sometimes there is a one a space and then a one dash two that's one and a half you may not see the one dash two so make sure you are careful before answering any questions if i can give you any advice take your time when you're passing the exam do not respond quickly take your time make sure you have the right answer i'm sure uh, every time I tried a test, there were at least five to ten errors that were stupid errors where I wasn't paying attention. So on the actual day, day of the exam, I made extra careful responses. Okay, so visibility, half statute mile with fog. And then the very last one means from 1600 Zulu time on the 13th, Variable wind direction at 6 knots, visibility greater than 6 statute miles with clear skies. I know, it looks like it's impossible, but believe me, look at them, remember some of the key words they're always going to be the same once you know you know just it's going to require a little bit of practice just make sure you go over them and answer uh, um, test questions so that you're able to recognize and understand what these mean thunderstorms okay the thunderstorms have three stages the cumulus stage mature stage and dissipating stage the cumulus stage is the lifting action of the air wind shear and turbulence is expected continuous strong updrafts prohibit the moisture from falling the mature stage is the most dangerous is the most violent and it will have precipitation which means rain and the dissipating stage is when the storm is about to be finished stable versus unstable air unstable air forms when there is cumuliform clouds turbulent air good visibility and shower precipitation just think of it this way if there is a lot of wind unstable air moving around you're not gonna have fog the air is gonna be pushed it's going to be visible it's going to be without uh, the air is not allowing anything to stand in its way stable air is stratiform clouds smooth air fair to poor visibility in haze and smoke and continuous precipitation stable air in the opposite is going to not move so there may be clouds fog mist and you will not have visibility again because there is stability it can rain continuously. If there was a lot of wind, it would move it around. Guy wires are those big metallic lines from structures are very dangerous. So you are required to fly at least 2000 feet horizontally from these structures. LiPo batteries can catch fire. Remember that for your exam. And then radio communication. 
Uh, you need to know that uh, they speak differently, the pilots speak differently on radios, and so you have to memorize this somewhat, uh, just become familiar with it. So the letters they use are always going to be these, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Golf, Hotel, India, Juliet, Kilo, Lima, Mike, November, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, Uniform, Victor, Whiskey, X-Ray, Yankee, and Zulu. Zero is zero. One is one. Two is two. Three is three. Four is four. Five is five. Six is six. Seven is seven. Eight is eight. Nine is niner. Hundred is hundred. Thousand is thousand. Five hundred is five hundred. 4,500 is 4,500. 10,000 is 10,000. 13,500 is 13,500. V12 is Victor 12. J533 is Juliet 533. 10 is 10. 122.1 is 122.1, 12,000 is 12,000, 12,500 is 12,500, 190 is flight level 190, flight 275 is flight level 275, magnetic course 005005, 005. Wind direction 220, wind 220, speed 250, 250 knots, speed 190 is 190 knots. Wilco means I will comply, Roger means received and understood, affirmative, negative, affirmative, yes, negative, no. There are four forces in an airplane, the lift, the weight, the thrust, and the drag. The lift is up, the weight is down, like gravity. The thrust is forward and the drag is backwards. So the lift is opposite the weight and the thrust is opposite the drag. So loading changes. The weight changes during flight might be from some kind of detachable load, like a package that's being delivered that can affect your weight and flight performance. You may have this question, like why did your weight change during flight? It can only be that a package has been delivered and that has affected the weight and flight performance. The center of gravity is the point at which your aircraft would perfectly balanced if it were suspended at that point. Its location depends on the distribution of weight in the aircraft. Load factor chart. You have this available in your exam uh, package. They may ask you a question. In fact, they probably will ask you a question. Let's say, so this is the bank angle and the load factor. So if an air, unmanned airplane weighs 33 pounds, what approximate weight would the airplane structure be required to support during a 30 degree banked turn while maintaining altitude? So your airplane is 33 pounds and it's making a 30 degree turn. So you look here at the bank angle, you go to 30 and you see here in the blue area, it says 30 degree. That means the load factor is 1.154. So what you do is you take the weight of your aircraft, you multiply it by 1.154 and you get 38 pounds. And that's your answer. Maintenance. 
If the manufacturer doesn't have a maintenance manual, you have to create your own. And pre-flight checklist, create your own. You should have checklists. If you do not have a checklist, that means you're a poor pilot in command. You should have checklists before you fly, you should have checklists before you plan the flight, and that may be a question on your exam. I highly recommend you find a location that gives practice tests. I did many practice tests before I went to the exam and it gave me a pretty good idea of what types of questions I would get and um, an even better idea of what type of questions I was unable to answer until I took notes and memorized some of the items that were stopping me from being able to pass those exams. Uh, when I saw that I was passing each test around the 90%, that's when I made an appointment for my exam. I hope everything we went over uh, will help you prepare for your successful drone pilot examination. I know that it can be overwhelming. I really insist that you will be able to remember everything. Just give it the right time. Study, study, study. Make sure that you understand everything. And best of luck. Thank you for being uh, on Katya's Buzz. Don't hesitate to look at this video a few times. Make sure you memorize all the content and some. Have a beautiful day and good luck with your exam. Thank you again for visiting Katya's Buzz. I love that you took the time to look at all of this information. I really, truly wish you the best of luck with your exam and I hope you have a blast flying your drone. It's amazing. I'm really just super excited. I'll see you around. Make sure you spend a minute to press like and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Have a beautiful day.